conferences from the European Parliament um, and from the Council of the EU. Some of you have already done very valuable work to promote human rights in Bahrain and have already met with uh, Bahraini activists present here today. Um, so we are here because it has now been 10 years since the Arab Spring protests broke out when thousands of pro-democracy protesters gathered at Pearl Roundabout in Manama to demand reform. And today we have invited a panel of activists and experts to discuss and commemorate the 10th anniversary of this 2011 uprising and to answer our questions about the democratic aspirations behind it, which to this day remain unfulfilled. So before we start, I would just like to say a few words about our co-host, Emi and his advisor, Laura Batalla, who have used their platform to raise awareness of the human rights violations happening in Bahrain. Uh, since 2014, Ernest has served as um, a member of the Greens Group at the European Parliament, and for some time now, he has been committed to working on human rights issues in Bahrain by sponsoring letters to the King of Bahrain, by spon sponsoring resolutions on the subject, uh, so I will now turn things over to him for his opening remarks. Thank you so much, uh, Ruth. Good afternoon and, and welcome everyone. Uh, it is my big pleasure to host this, uh, this timely event uh, as we approach the 10th anniversary of the revolution in Bahrain uh, with the European Center for Democracy and Human Rights. Really, thank you so much for the good cooperation in organizing this. Uh, the protest, well, I don't have to tell you that, uh, uh, but the protest erupting 10 years ago marked, uh, in my opinion, a turning point across the Arab world. However, as we all know, the wind of change and hope which swept, which swept through the entire region at that time uh, failed to produce in Bahrain the results it has achieved in other Arab countries. A decade later, the democratic aspirations of, of the Bahraini population remain unfulfilled. Um, what is worse, the government's measures to silent political dissent and opposition have only gotten worse. And this is what we try also to, to, uh, to denounce at the level of the European Parliament with uh, some of our colleagues. So the idea of today's conference and, uh, is that we hope to raise awareness about the current human rights situation in Bahrain, but also to look for ways in which we can uh, put the cases of violations of human rights on the EU's agenda more uh, prominently. And I'm sure we will be looking at the uh, uh, so far not so successful human rights dialogue between the EU and the country. As a member of the Delegation for Relations with the Arab Peninsula, I have been uh, pushing, as I was mentioning now, for a resolution on the human rights situation in Bahrain, in particular the cases of dead row, uh, death row inmates Mohamed Ramadan and Hussein Ali Mosa, as well as the case of human rights defenders and prisoners of conscience. With the support of other colleagues present today, uh, Hannah Neumann is online, Marta Rabella will be later. So from the European Parliament, I can assure you we will continue to raise our voice uh, for the voiceless uh, people for, for, of Bahrain and all the people who are fighting uh, in favor of human rights. Today's event also comes a few days after the visit of the Bahrain, uh, Bahraini Foreign Affairs Minister to Brussels uh, to seal a cooperation agreement with the EU. Uh, and as I was just mentioning now, I regret that the human rights dialogue with Bahrain was postponed once again. Human rights are an imp uh, as important as any other issue in our bilateral relationships, and uh, we will be closely monitoring the national plan for human rights in which the government is working at the moment. So, uh, uh, with uh, uh, concluding my, um, my remarks, uh, I am very pleased to have uh, today with us a unique panel of speakers, including testimonies and on-the-ground activists, international NGOs, um, and UN former and current representatives who will give us uh, a first-hand account of the situation. Uh, and once again, before, before ending, I would like to thank all the speakers for having accepted, firstly, our invitation, uh, and the European Center for Democracy and Human Rights again, as I was mentioning at the beginning, for the excellent cooperation in making this event <laughs> happen. So voila, uh, nothing else from my side, and without further ado, I'll give the floor back to Ruth and to Sarah, who will introduce the speakers. And I hope that everybody will enjoy the discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, MEP Urtasun, for, for your words and uh, in particular for your remarks concerning the urgent resolution on, on Bahrain. I believe that the discussion that is about to begin will prove that the human rights situation in, in Bahrain has indeed been deteriorating in the last decades. 
um, and that a resolution on, um, on Bahrain should be prioritized at the next plenary session in March. I would also like to extend a special thanks to the members of your team, in particular to Laura Bataglia, who has been instrumental in organizing this conference. Um, um, if you could all mute, your, mute yourself, please. Thank you. Um, before I give the floor to, to our panelists, I would like to say a few words about the Q&A session we will have at the end. Um, I encourage everyone to leave questions and comments in the chat box um, while the speakers give the presentations. Ruth myself and myself will read these out loud and then give the panelists the, the opportunity to respond to them. So if you um, wish to make a, a brief intervention as well, at the end, you can also click on the raise your hand option on Zoom and we will give you the floor. Those of you who are watching the live stream on YouTube, please leave questions and comments in the comments section and we will make sure to, to address those as well. Now, without any further ado, I will, I will introduce to you our first panelist, Devin, Devin Kenny, um, who is a researcher at Amnesty International, where he focuses on cases of human rights violations in, in the Gulf region. He writes on topics related to the suppression of the political opposition in Bahrain, and he documents cases of medical negligence inside um, Bahraini prisons. Today, he will talk to us about the democratic space in Bahraini society, 10 years after the 2011 demonstrations. Devin, the floor is all yours now. Hello, thank you, and thanks all. So I'm going to uh, focus my remarks on how we can gain some insight into the intense level of repression of the last decade uh, by comparing it to the previous decade. The first decade of the new millennium in Bahrain was a period of announced and to some extent uh, implemented reforms. That process got started when a new Amir, uh, Hamad bin Isa, came into office in 1999, succeeding his father, and he later changed his title to king. So anyway, King Hamad in 2002, at sort of the peak moment of the real reforms that occurred, um, announced a pardon of all so-called uh, political crimes. Sorry, noise in the background is my cat who is absolutely furious with me today. I hate working from home. <laughs> um, so the political pardon um, actually encouraged virtually all of the Bahraini dissidents who had been in exile uh, abroad to return home to the islands. And this included uh, three quite significant figures within Bahraini civil society who would go on to found three institutions that would be very important in Bahraini uh, society and politics for the next decade and beyond. Uh, the first of these figures was Sheikh Ali Salman, who's a very well-known Shia cleric and who is the leader of al wifaq which is the uh, largest of the Shia opposition groups, at least among those that have participated in Bahraini elections, parliamentary elections, and is also actually the largest political grouping in the country period, at least if you judge by the results, the returns of uh, parliamentary elections prior to their resignation from the parliament in 2011 in protest at the repression that year al Wifaq had had, um, it was either 18 or 19 uh, deputies in the lower house of parliament, the elected house, out of a total of 40, and that's the largest block that's, uh, that's ever been in the parliament under the system established in the 2002 constitution. So that's uh, Sheikh Ali Salman and al Wifaq. The second figure is Mansour al-Jamri, who returned from exile in Britain to found the newspaper Al-Wasat which was the, uh, the sole and exclusive um, independent and opposition-oriented media outlet in Bahrain, uh, on the ground in Bahrain, for the next decade and more. And the third figure was Abdul Hadi al Khawaja, who returned from exile in Denmark and was one of, not the only one, but one of the key founders of the Bahrain Center for Human Rights, BCHR, which was um, by far the most active uh, human rights oriented NGO on the ground and uh, did some of the strongest work in, in documenting human rights conditions in those years. So the key point about all three of these institutions is that they took pains to operate within the letter of the law in Bahrain. Al-Wifaq registered with the government as a political society in 2001. 
uh, BCHR, the Bahrain Center for Human Rights, registered as a non-governmental organization in 2002. The newspaper Al Wasat uh, began publishing also in 2002. I haven't been able to find their registration record, but it's quite clear that the government uh, recognized their existence as legal. One indication of this would be that on the date of their very first publication, which was 7 September 2002, they were granted uh, and ran an interview with King Hamad. Now, all of that was reversed uh, from 2011 on. Um, Al-Wifaq was dissolved by court order in 2016. Al-Wasat was suppressed by the Ministry of Information Affairs the following year, 2017. And BCHR, the Bahrain Center for Human Rights again, had actually been delicensed in 2004 after Al Khawaja had given a speech denouncing the late prime minister. Uh, but despite the delicensing, they had actually managed to continue to operate more or less openly on the ground uh, up till 2011. In 2011, um, you know, immediately concurrent with the events, uh, Abdul Hadi Al Khawaja was put in prison for life. And another key figure from BCHR, uh, Nabil Rajab, has spent the majority of the past decade in prison. Um, he's currently out, but this was, you know, uh, quite effective in dealing um, a strong blow to BCHR. And finally, I should add that Sheikh Ali Salman is also now the leader of Al-Wifaq, is also now also serving uh, a life sentence in prison. And I'd like to, or it's worth lingering for just a moment on Al-Wifaq in particular and how um, insistent and principled they were on working within <clears throat> the existing legal and constitutional order uh, in Bahrain that had been structured by the government. Uh, because they did so at great political cost to themselves. Um, Al-Wifaq chose to participate in Bahrain's parliamentary elections, the parliamentary electoral process beginning in 2006, and they did so at the cost of splintering their own movement. Um, a faction within Al-Wifaq, which would come to be known as Haq, broke off from them, making the argument that no one should lend any sort of cover or legitimacy to a state structured process, which they said would lead to no real change um, by participating in elections and other processes structured by the government. So this is just illustrative of how consummately moderate uh, al Wifaq was and is as a movement and how intense the government's commitment to repression is uh, since it's you know, uh, legally crushed and outlawed um, the most prominent movement uh, with an opposition coloration that, that was actually attempting to work with it and work within the system. So in the fate of these three organizations, you can see how over the last decade, um, any political space that may have been opened in Bahrain in 1999 uh, has been closed. Whatever one thinks of that period, the reform period uh, up through 2010 and its limits and red lines and faults, uh, it is objectively a fact that today Bahrain is considerably more repressive than it was at the start of this millennium. Historians of Bahrain have noted that the country will rarely go 10 years without seeing a major cycle of political protest. Unfortunately, the last such major cycle in 2011 uh, ended with such a degree of violence that it was um, unusually and especially traumatic for Bahraini society. And it's difficult to say when that trauma will recede to the point that a critical number of people will again be willing um, to, to protest. But we can at least hope that in the coming decade, we will see Bahrainis again find the courage to speak, to organize, and to assemble and claim their full rights as citizens. Thank you. Thank you, Devin. Thank you very much for your insights on the shrinking democratic space in Bahrain. Um, in your intervention, you mentioned the reprisal against imprisoned opposition figures and human rights defenders, including Abdul Hadi Al Khawaja, who is a dual EU citizen uh, and Bahraini citizen, and whose organization, the Bahrain Center for Human Rights, was shut down indeed because of a speech that he gave. 
The idea of silencing dissent brings us to the second topic that we will be exploring today, um, the government's crackdown on free speech. Um, we will be doing this with David Kay, who was the UN Special Rapporteur on the promotion and protection of the right to freedom of opinion and expression from 2014 to 2020. Um, as a professor of law at the University of California, his work continues to focus on human rights abuses. So David, I will yield the floor to you now. Great, thank you, Ruth. Uh, and thanks to the organizers for this event, uh, which is extremely important. And thanks especially to Devin for setting the scene uh, with his, uh, his really important remarks a moment ago. I want to just say a few words. I don't want to take up too much time um, and, and just say a few things about advocacy at the international level. But let me start with the fundamentals, which is Bahrain is obligated, like all states, to respect the freedom of opinion and expression of its citizens, of in fact, of anyone within its jurisdiction. That's the respect for the right to maintain an opinion without interference. And that's the right to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas of all kinds, regardless of frontiers and through any media. And it is these sets of rights, in addition to rights to religious belief and conscience, to peaceful assembly and, and, um, and basic physical autonomy, as we see in cases related to torture and violence against the person, where Bahrain for clearly as Devin highlighted, even more than 10 years, but especially in the last 10 years and especially uh, recently, has been violating many of these rights and violating them with a degree of impunity that is uh, rather extraordinary, if not um, also seen in many countries around the world. With that, with that kind of background, I just wanted to point to a few different uh, avenues of advocacy that I've seen over the last six or seven years that I think have been especially important. And I wanna highlight for people in part to pay tribute to all of you and those of you who are activists in the space for keeping the flame going on in terms of highlighting the degree to which Bahrain has been repressing uh, the population. So in, in preparing uh, for this event, I actually went back and looked at communications that I, a special rapporteur, often in collaboration with other special rapporteurs of the Human Rights Council, sent directly in, as a formal mechanism, formal letters uh, to the government of Bahrain through the Bahraini mission to the United Nations in Geneva. And um, I identified 27 communications over that six year period uh, from 2014 to 2020. And in fact, 55 communications from February 2011 until today. Um, it's actually probably a little bit more than 55 communications. Those communications highlighted to the Bahraini government very serious concerns dealing with a range of repressions, attacks on the media, as Devin highlighted, attacks and detentions of defenders uh, like Nabil Rajab or members of the Al Khawaja family or. Sheikh Al Saman, many, many others. Um, detention of religious figures and human rights defenders. Regularly, we received information from many of you that informed those communications. Those communications are, not, are now public documents that over the course of 10 years tell the story, not only of continued repression of the people of Bahrain by the government of Bahrain, but also in an interesting um, uh, in, in, an interesting phenomenon because many, many governments simply do not respond to communications from special procedures of the Human Rights Council. We received regularly responses from the, the government of Bahrain justifying their behavior, justifying its behavior. And I would encourage people to go look at those, uh, those documents, those communications and the responses and also to use them in your own advocacy. Those are formal documents that tell a story of repression and they tell a story of how advocacy can highlight the repression of a government. 
And, and I think this, um, this has highlighted something that's very important. And we see this in particular in the last several weeks, last couple of months, as Bahrain, which is a member of the Human Rights Council, an elected member of the Human Rights Council through the end of this year, sought to be president, sought to gain the presidency of the Human Rights Council, and it failed. In part, that was because one of the uh, candidates, Fiji, had a very strong human rights record and the ambassador had very strong reputation. But I think it's also because of the advocacy that many of you have done that has highlighted the fact that Bahrain, as a human rights matter, has no, uh, has no ability, has no capacity, should not have the competence to be the president of the central human rights body of the United Nations. As we think about, and I'll conclude here, as we think about advocacy at the international level, I would encourage many of you to continue what you're doing, to continue to raise the issues of both specific individuals and general repression that we see in Bahrain, but also work with others as you have done to ensure that the Human Rights Council in its next iteration, as it moves to elect new members at the end of this year, that is as the General Assembly does that, that we all work toward a human rights council that is more reflective of rights respecting governance than rights interfering governance as reflected by Bahrain. So I'll, I'll close there, again, paying tribute to all of the work that you do and to all of the work that you will continue to do to highlight the kind of repression and the kind of rights that everybody in Bahrain uh, it should be enjoying and is guaranteed under international law. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you, David, for um, sharing with us your expertise on, on the oppressive restrictions that authoritarian regimes like Bahrain impose on, on the rights of freedom of expression and peaceful assembly, as you said despite the country's, um, the country's obligation to, to protect these rights under international law. And thank you also for um, highlighting opportunities for advocacy that NGOs and, and members of Bahraini civil society can take to, to address these issues and, and the importance of this type of work. I know that unfortunately you cannot stay with us for the entire duration of the event. You have to, to leave quite soon. So let me thank you now for, for your participation and, and contribution to, to this event. Thank you very much. Um, you. As both Devin and David just mentioned, the, um, the erosion of the democratic space um, and the limitations placed on one's freedom of speech affect all segments of, of society from opposition figures to the um, human rights defenders and members of civil society. For this special occasion, we have received a short video testimony from Najah Al Yusuf, a Bahraini civil servant and uh, brave human rights defender who was convicted and imprisoned in 2018 for her human rights activities and for her participation in the 2011 uprisings. In this video, she recounts her experience of physical violence and sexual abuse during a 2017 interrogation by the state authorities. Ryan, if you could please share your screen now and uh, play the video, thank you. I will mute myself in the meantime. Ryan, we can't hear it very well, at least on my part. I'm going to go to the 
I'm not sure everybody was able to hear that on my part, the sound quality wasn't very good, but at least we hope that you could follow the subtitles. Um, so this was a powerful testimony um, of the Bahraini activist, uh, Najal Youssef, um, who was punished for her human rights work. And in this video, Najal describes how in 2017, during an interrogation at the Muharraq police station, she was sexually assaulted and beaten for having refused to collaborate with the police forces. Um, and very bravely, she has sent us this video uh, to so show during the event. Uh, Naja's testimony brings us to an important part of our discussion, which is the role of women in political activism in Bahrain. Um, we are very lucky to have Dr. Alal Shahabi on the panel today, as she herself also is a London Bayer and researcher. Uh, she is the co-founder of Bahrain Watch, an NGO that advocates for social justice. Um, can you hear me? Sorry, my internet went out, I think. Yes. Um, so Bahrain Watch, an NGO that advocates for social justice and accountability in Bahrain. And she is also currently the deputy director of the Institute for Global Prosperity at University College of London. Ala, thank you so much for joining us, and I will now leave the floor to you. Thank you, um, and th thank you for sharing that video of uh, Najah. Um, I think, uh, despite her voice not being so clear, we got the message through the subtitles, and um, and it's very courageous. I mean, we need to also point out that she's still in Bahrain, right? And she is one of the last few activists who who is still willing to speak out, even despite having paid such a heavy price in terms of her own um, safety and well-being um, and spending years in prison. So this is partly um, what I'd like to talk about, which is this rupture in uh, the increasing state focus on gendered violence towards uh, female protesters. And... Um, that, that marks it differently to other uprisings and res state responses that we've had in the past and, and forms of repression. So in, this, in, in the case of 2011, uh, the scale of female participation and the form that it took has left a permanent legacy. 
um, one in which uh, gendered orders in the region and uh, sort of the, the patriarchal, obviously political structures in the region were left in turmoil. And women played a large role in both the creation of these uprisings and in their continuation. Bahrain obviously was no exception. Uh, there were hundreds of thousands of women who took part alongside men uh, in the protests, and they were and their role was really quite visible uh, in the iconic imagery that was produced. Um, so, I mean, we all, you know, as in other countries, we in Bahrain there were a set of iconic and hero heroic female figures that took part. Uh, one of them being obviously Najah um, and. People like Zainab al-Khawaja and many other maybe less visible women who played such a critical and important role in the uprisings. Um, in other countries, for example, women like Tawakkal al-Kurman received the Nobel Peace Prize, even if their role in later politics sort of slightly undermined that. Um, in Bahrain, we saw female doctors, nurses, teachers, mothers uh, who were central to the street protests. Um, they were sheltering, treating, encouraging, and organizing street activism. And the more that women were active, the harsher the strategies that the state used to alienate them from their activism. Consequently, this alienation is useful to shed light on the ways in which women, rather than coming to claim, um, they came to be alienated from and dispossessed from their active political role. Um, and so today, uh, very, very you, you'll see very few women in the political space um, or in the political sphere within the state and within the opposition sort of having such a visible role and voice as they did in 2011, which is an important kind of attraction. Uh, even though the news that came from Saudi Arabia yesterday, for example, the release of Lujain and Hedlul from prison also highlights the role that women have played in Saudi and this changing role in the Gulf as a whole, that the future of any um, political order will have to include women. Um, so, I mean, this is not just an important factor in understanding uh, what's happened since 2011. It's also, we need to understand why the state is focusing on these women. Um, and this is, is this just simply an act of, like an illogical act of violence. Why would someone like Lujain, who simply drove a car, or someone like Najah, who wasn't very well known internationally or had a large voice, would be subject to, su to such kind of brutal torture and sexual abuse in prison. Let's, let's, this is also not just gender, it's also sexualized in some way. So, I mean, this is just one question that I'm putting out there and it's a question that we all have to ask ourselves um, because it sets it apart from the forms of repression that we saw in the past. So, I mean, unfortunately, I just come to echo what the previous speakers have said. Uh, the, 27, the 2011 revolutions um, have only uh, taken the, the, the countries and the, and the conditions back to a situation that was worse um, than what existed before 2011, 10 years on. It's the sort of antithesis of what we were asking for and demanding. Uh, political leaders uh, nearly all of the all of the opposition group leaders and human rights activists, journalists, and others have been severely punished, jailed, and silenced, or are in exile. Thousand, nearly thousand five hundred of the protesters and leaders still remain in jail. Some of them have been mentioned, like Abdul Hadi Al Khawaja, and others are less well known. Um, and one woman is still in prison in Bahrain. So this is the, the 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 significance of Bahrain, even despite its small geography, is that it also heralded the first triumph of a military crackdown in the whole region. Don't forget, you know, the uprising only lasted for three weeks, and the invasion of the Saudi military forces was a harbinger of things to come elsewhere. That the counter revolutions will 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 spare no one and nobody in order to regain uh, military control of the whole region. And it was pitched as necessary to avoid instability, right? And I mean, the other significance is Bahrain is a political ally of the West. It's not some other, you know, this country that there is no, no kind of form of leverage or control over. In fact, the strength of US and uh, British leverage on on the regimes is so strong that it, that it actually, I would say, coerced some of these regimes into entering um, the normalization deal with Israel. Uh, that was perceived by, you know, uh, across the board in Bahrain, you know, 
pro and anti-government people as the final act of betrayal almost, uh, the con com complete relinquishing of one of the Arabs' biggest causes, which is Palestinian justice and the end to the occupation in, in Palestine. And that could have only come about through the kind of uh, leverage that someone like Trump uh, was willing to do, literally to threaten Bahrain with removing its U.S. base, can 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 herald a, a, an act like that at a tremendous political cost to these regimes. I think we will only begin to understand that in the in in the future period. But I think we we it's too late to kind of assume that this can this that, that kind of act of betrayal can pass. Um, without any cost to the regimes in any way. So, I mean, as, as well as those kind of broader geopolit the geopolitics of the region, which isn't just an abstract geopolitical equation, has some material, has a material impact on the closure of public space and dissent within the country. Um, at no cost, there is that, you know, they, they act with complete impunity, despite all of the human rights activism and, and Bahrain, in fact, also, I would argue, has one of the, the, the strongest civil society spaces, um, despite its closure. I mean, people still meet and organize and speak in private or in secret and work underground um, or work strongly from abroad as much as they can because of the history of, of exile uh, and, and um, this act of removing citizenship has forced hundreds of people to leave the country, has has led them to form new groupings abroad and kind of continue, continue to harbour a civil society as much as they can um, that can talk and speak out about this and amplify the voices within the country. Um, but based on this, 2011, it's not, it's, I, I'm one of, I mean, I'm not one of the few, uh, as painful as it was, it's not a chapter that's yet been closed. It's not the conclusion of a book that's been written about the, the, the history of, um, of the Arab world. It's, I think, the afterlife of the uprisings in 2011 is still incomplete. It's a process of, of continual eradication of dissent. It hasn't finished yet. I mean, just this week, there were tens of young village boys that were rounded up and arrested and we, we there are reports of that weekly so obviously the afterlife continues and um, the there's still contestation over you know the political power that were you know that were carried on the banners and the slogans of the 2011 protests so I think it's just as David Kenny pointed out it's just a, qu a question of it's just a matter of time not not if but when and um, you know I I wouldn't you know, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't want to put money on it, but I mean, I could see that the conditions that cause these uprisings to happen have not gone away. Um, so that the idea that you can regain stability through violence only creates more instability and fragility. Um, and so we have to wait and see what will happen in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, thank you, Allah, for this detailed overview of the uh, valuable role that um, women like Najah and, and Zainab al-Khawaja played and continue to, to play to this day in the struggle for human rights and democracy in, in Bahrain. And uh, thank you also for highlighting that change can only happen when women are included in the political discourse and, and democratic space of, of a country. Um, our next panelist is Jeed Basuni, so I would like to introduce her to you. Um, Jeed currently works as a project manager um, on the death penalty at Reprieve. Um, she is part of the Middle East and North Africa division of the organization. Oui. Okay. Oh, hello. Oh. hello. <laughs> um, and um, as I was saying, she, she has contributed to uh, a lot of articles and, and reports on topics such as the Muslim Brotherhood in, in Egypt and the use of the death penalty against juvenile offenders in Saudi Arabia. Today, however, she will talk to us about the instrumentalization of the death penalty in, in Bahrain. Jeed, thank you so much for, for being here today and I will leave the floor to you now. Thank you, thank you so much for that introduction and thank you for inviting Reprieve to be part of this really important panel today. Um, so as Sarah was saying, I'm going to use my time today to talk to you a little bit about the use of the death penalty in Bahrain since 2011. Um, at Reprieve, we work to end the death penalty worldwide, and in Bahrain specifically, we work with our local partner, uh, BIRD, the Bahrain Institute for Rights and Democracy, and together we work on three cases of people on death row. 
but we also look at researching and analyzing the use of the death penalty in Bahrain more generally. Um, and part of this work is maintaining a database and we track the use of the death penalty throughout the country. Um, so we have quite detailed information of who is on death row. Um, so I'll be sharing some of the information we have from this database with you and part of our general work later um, today. So if we're looking at how the death penalty has unfolded in the last 10 years in Bahrain, what becomes undoubtedly clear is that the use of the death penalty has drastically risen in the last decade. Um, and I think this very much chimes with what we've heard from the other panelists today about the overall deterioration in human rights. Um, so if we compare the 10 years before the Arab Spring with the last decade, our data shows that death sentences in Bahrain have increased by 600% since 2011. Um, and currently there are 27 people on death row in Bahrain, 26 of whom are at risk of imminent execution. What we mean when we say at risk of imminent execution is that these people have ex exhausted all legal options available to them. The highest court in Bahrain has upheld their death sentences um, and they could be executed as soon as the king ratifies these, uh, these verdicts. If we just focus on execution since 2011, there have been six. Um, so between 2010 and 2017, there was a de facto moratorium in Bahrain on executions. But unfortunately, in 2017, um, a year that marked a further decline in, human rights, uh, in the human rights situation in Bahrain, um, Bahrain executed three torture victims. At the time, the UN Special Rapporteur on Executions described these executions as extrajudicial killings. Um, two years later, in 2019, Bahrain executed Ali Al Arab, Ahmed Al Malali, and um, an unnamed Bangladeshi migrant. Despite calls from several UN Special Rapporteurs for Bahrain to halt these executions because there were well-founded concerns that Ali and Ahmed had been tortured. If we put these figures into context, um, in 2019, Bahrain's execution rate per capita was almost two thirds of the per capita rate of executions in Iran, which we know is one of the world's most prolific executioners. So any way that we look at these figures, it's and it's just so clear that Bahrain is sentencing more people to death, it's executing more people, and there is a death penalty crisis in the country. Um, and following on with, from what the other panelists have said, um, we have seen that the death penalty is used to silence dissent, it's used to punish those who take part in protests against the government. Um, there are 12 such cases on death row as we speak of people who are charged with trumped up terrorism charges um, for attending protests. Um, the vast majority of these people have been tortured by Bahraini security authorities. And unfortunately, we can also say that the use of torture is endemic in the Bahraini justice system, as we heard from Najah earlier, um, and particularly in cases involving the death penalty. There are 11 people on death row right now who allege that they were tortured into confessing to crimes which they didn't commit. And this torture evidence has been used to sentence them to death. Two such cases which I want to talk to you about are our clients Muhammad Ramadan and Hussein Musa, who were mentioned at the start of, of this panel. Um, they are at risk of imminent execution. Both men alleged to have been tortured. And the evidence used to sentence them to death hinges purely on Hussein's torture extracted confession. And throughout the years, Reprieve and Bird have worked with legal experts who have raised the alarm that these cases have been tried, how these cases have been tried. Um, the reliance of judges on this torture evidence, the lack of due process rights. Um, and although the Bahraini authorities claim to have investigated these torture um, allegations, there are independent torture experts like the IRCT who have reviewed these documents in this case, and they have assessed that these investigations fail to meet minimal legal standards and the professional standards outlined in things like the Istanbul Pro Protocol. Unfortunately, in 2019, despite a lot of international effort and pressure, um, Mohammed and Hussein's death sentence was reinstated by a court of appeal. And then last year, in a hearing that lasted only 15 minutes, the court of cassation upheld their death sentences. Both of these courts relied on torture evidence to, to sentence them to death. So I think what's clear is that Mohammed and Hussein have been failed repeatedly by the Bahraini justice system. And the numbers I mentioned earlier show that many others are at similar risk. With 26 people at risk of imminent execution, we're really concerned that this is a tragedy in the making. We're concerned that we might soon witness a mass execution take place in Bahrain. 
Um, but I do, I do believe that this tragedy it can be prevented. So part of our recommendations at Reprieve is for those in the audience, the international community, to make representations at the highest level, demanding that the Bahraini government implement an immediate moratorium on the use of the death penalty. We'd ask that you also urge the Bahraini government to commute the death sentences of everyone on death row. And finally, we would recommend to the MEPs in the audience today um, to support an upcoming resolution at the European Parliament, which will focus on the human rights situation in Bahrain. Thank you. Thank you, Jeet. Uh, thank you for talking to us about the escalation in the use of the death penalty in Bahrain since 2011. The numbers and statistics that you shared with us are indeed concerning. And as you said, this should highlight the need for these matters to be addressed by the international community, um, including EU officials in their interactions with their Bahraini counterparts. I would now like to introduce our final guest, Mr. Brian Dooley, uh, who is a senior advisor to the current UN Special Rapporteur on the Situation of Human Rights Defenders, Ms. Mary Lawlor. Um, Brian, would you perhaps like to comment on, briefly comment on the situation of Bahraini human rights defenders on the ground? I will, uh, and thank you very much for uh, inviting me and for organizing this. Before I talk about anything uh, in Bahrain, I, I think after 10 years, it's a good moment actually to reflect on um, all the things that have happened outside of Bahrain about Bahrain. So, you know, I, I've been working in, in human rights for decades and I've never seen anything quite like it, I think, in terms of how, I mean, David K touched on it a little bit. Uh, Al Shahabi also spoke about it. Uh, the importance of the work done by really a fairly small number of people uh, in exile, a sort of civil society diaspora, if you like. And I'm not just saying this because we're talking about Bahrain or because those people deserve to be recognized. That's true. But it's extraordinary. And I don't know how many of you who are really just focused on Bahrain really understand how different it is compared to other countries also suffering human rights tragedies. Uh, the ability of, again, a, a pretty small number of Bahrainis to advocate internationally the success that they've had the amount of international media coverage they've had, being able to put this uh, issue of Bahrain, the smallest country in the region, on the agenda year after year at the UN, the EU Parliament, um, in the US Congress. I mean, I've, I've seen it up close from Washington and it's extraordinary, you know, Saeed Ahmed and Al Shahabi and Mariam and Zainab Ahwaja, uh, Ali Mushaymed. I mean, not many people, it, it, it really is extraordinary. The only thing I can think of really that's at all comparable was uh, in the 1980s and the uh, South African diaspora organizing against apartheid who ultimately that diaspora uh, was victorious, but there were many, many more of them. Uh, and so I know some days are very bleak and it looks like nothing is happening, but when you look at the, the amount of attention which activists outside the country have managed to keep focused on Bahrain. Um, really, it's something very impressive and, and something which you all really should be proud of. Which brings me to the second thing, which is it takes an enormous amount of pressure to make anything happen in Bahrain. If we look at the few things which, which we have been able to push the Bahraini government on, um, I mean, going right back to the, to the medics, to the, um, to the setting up of the Basuni Commission, uh, some releases since then, all of them took an enormous amount of effort. And so that, that level of activism is required even for fairly small or piecemeal uh, gains. And uh, we've seen, you know, in, I mean, comparable, I think the, the release, not quite the freedom, but the release of Lou Jane yesterday. Um, I mean, that took a colossal amount of international pressure just to have her released, not completely free. And so that's the, that's the threshold we have to reach to make anything happen in Bahrain. And, it, and it, it's, it, it's exhausting. It takes an awful lot of dedication. And I'd like to pay tribute to that dedication that people have had over the years. Um, I think that, 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 you know, Sarah at the beginning of this discussion said, uh, she predicted that this debate would show um, 
how things have deteriorated in Bahrain. And I think that's right because they, they have. Uh, I think another serious question to ask is what can we do about it? Um, I don't think that the Biden administration is going to change everything completely and certainly not overnight, but I do think it changes the context a bit. I've been working on Bahrain for 10 years. I haven't been allowed into Bahrain uh, for the last nine. So I remember advocating uh, with the Obama um, administration and it wasn't like things were easy then either. So it's not all Trump's fault. Um, things weren't great under Obama, but there is now some degree of new opportunity um, with the new Biden administration. Uh, and again, the amount of pressure that's been put on Congress over the years has been extraordinary by those activists. Um, another thing I think which is, is worth pushing, clearly, you know, the, the major players here, apart from the US, are um, the EU and, I guess, sort of slightly separately now, Britain. Um, the EU has a dialogue uh, with Bahrain on February the 22nd, and it really should push for the release immediately of human rights defenders, including, of course, EU citizen, uh, Albert Hardy uh, Al-Hawaja, but also of Najib Fatil and, and the others. Uh, and then Britain really needs to look at its new role post-Brexit. Uh, does it really want to be the place where repressive regimes come because uh, they are friendlier uh, and uh, they get a warmer welcome than they do in the rest of the EU? I think we have to recalibrate after 10 years, clearly. You know, things aren't shifting much in Bahrain. Um, there are some opportunities new now um, because of the change of government in the US. Uh, but I think we have to be, um, while keeping the same level of energy and dedication over the last decade, you know, we probably have to pick battles a bit more smartly. Uh, and, it's, and it's very difficult. And I'm not... Um, I'm not suggesting that that people like me should suggest how to do that. Uh, it's up to the Bahrainis to uh, to figure that out. Uh, so really, I just want to say thank you and and how impressive it is to all those who've been working on this for the last ten years. Um, and please keep seizing those opportunities at the UN, uh, at the EU, uh, and at the US. And thanks very much again for inviting me to speak. Brian, thank you. Thank you so much for this special intervention. And, uh, and thank you for sharing with us your insights into the um, importance of the work that human rights defenders inside and outside Bahrain carry out every single day and, and the impact that their actions have on the situation on the ground. Um, I believe we don't have that much time left. I know that um, MEP Tarabella wanted to say a couple of words and I can see he's, he's here with us today. So mm -hmm. if you want to, to comment on these interventions, MEP Tarabella, I can give you the floor. If not, then we can proceed with the uh, Q&A session. I'll, I'll leave it up to you. Thank you so much to you and uh, sorry for uh, arriving a little bit late. I had a problem, but... Uh, Listening to you, to your all intervention, I, I would like to assure you and thanks uh, my good colleagues, uh, Urtas and Ernest, for the organization of the, this meeting. Uh, we are very careful on that. I'm sure that he and me, we, I would assure you that in my group, I try to push to have Bahrain on urgency that we have every month. And uh, I confess you that this time I was very angry in my group. Why? Because and at the end, when we choose, you know, there are several problems in the world uh, and they are all very important. OK, but when we choose some other countries, newly, you know, I, I, I told this time, Bahrain, one year ago, we, we, we succeed to have the urgency at the agenda. And unfortunately, because the COVID crisis in March, we cancel all urgencies for a couple of months. And Bahrain disappeared of the agenda. And I think that next month, one year that we, we had of the agenda, and for one year, we don't have anymore. And of course, the situation is not improving. And what you mentioned today, your tes testimony, but it's clear that the situation maybe is worse and uh, becoming worse. And I think that next time I, I asked to my group to say, next time, one year anniversary that we have to push Bahrain. And I, I hope that in March, you will be on the agenda for the emergency, so uh, human rights urgencies, because it's necessity. And listening to your uh, what all of you say, I think it's uh, a priority. I'm sure that Ernest will push push in the, in the green group, 
but we have uh, Ernest Urtasun and the Greens group and me, we don't have the majority. We have to, to encourage other political groups also to, and I think that I'm sure that uh, in other group, we try to convince the majority of this parliament to finally, and uh, you merit that, to have an urgency on uh, Bahrain at the agenda as it was normally the case in last March, 2020. I see in the chat, uh, thank you, Mimi Peter Avela. I see that we have another question from MEP Neumann. Um, if you'd like, you can read it out, otherwise I can do it. So I will, I will ask it. Um, she says, I met the foreign minister of Bahrain Tuesday where he shared information about an ongoing process towards a national human right plan with broad inclusion of civil society. I would like to hear what the panelists think about this process, if, sorry, if there's any way to influence it positively. Um, thank you. Also this for this complimentary perspective, very highly valued. Um, if any of our panelists would like to uh, comment on this, feel free to do so. Um, I can take a crack at that first at least. Um, yes. So I guess uh, two points about Bahrain's human rights plan and human rights reforms. Um, Bahrain has become very active in putting forth its narrative about human rights uh, reforms, or if you like, quote unquote, reforms that it's making. Um, the first point, I guess, is that, you know, some of these- What's happening with you? Oh, uh, sorry, some of these, um, you know, they're, they're real in a way. So like last year, um, Bahrain annulled the regulation that uh, restricted women to certain professions. It was said that women couldn't work in physically strenuous professions. They annulled that. Um, they've also instituted um, like um, a, an alternate sentencing scheme so that uh, perhaps, you know, various offenders, drug offenders might um, might do like community service and be on probation and be monitored rather than go to jail. Those things are true, but all these reforms are deliberately designed to avoid the sort of the core interests as the state perceives them, which is to quash uh, the domestic political opposition, mm -hmm. um, especially, unfortunately, there's a invariable or inevitable or unavoidable sectarian element to it. So especially uh, the Shia political opposition, which is represented in all with fuck. So by doing these sort of reforms at the margins, maybe some of them are truly implemented and are okay, but it's a deliberate tactic to avoid uh, other absolutely necessary reforms to for Bahrain to make um, if the society is actually going to open up and improve and become a better place for, for everyone who lives there. Um, I'll leave it at that. Can I just add to Devin's point that um, if we're talking about new institutions to safeguard human rights, we've been through this before with Bahrain in the last 10 years with the authorities, with the Special Investigation Unit, the Ombudsman, the National Institute for Human Rights. And the problem with these organizations and with these bodies is they lack any type of independence. Um, they are often report directly to the Minister of Interior, Minister of Justice, they're quite embedded in these structures that are deeply involved in the repression. Um, and in the end, they're used to whitewash um, torture and human rights violations instead of you know, supporting the people who are the victims of these abuses. So I would recommend that if any new body like that is going to be formed or put together, then we need to ensure that they are independent and they are able, they have that freedom to um, be able to scrutinize any human rights violations um, independently. Thank you both um, Jeed and, and, and Devin. I see that Sayed has um, his hand up. So if you'd like to ask a question then we can perhaps give you the floor Sayed and then we will address more questions from, from the chat. So please type them up. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. I just first I wanted to say uh, thank you to Brian Dooley in particular and our uh, condolences to him as he lost his mother to COVID and had the funeral just over the weekend. So uh, we with you, Brian, and we have 
we're glad to have a friend like you and in, in the movement and i wanted to say to dr hannah it's a very important question what the bahraini fm is promoting to you and if they wanted to if they don't have a problem with civil societies then why individuals like myself would have no citizenship i'm a currently a stateless individual and if they have if they are claiming that they have no problem they should start correcting the wrong before we involve or anyone involved with them because without by allowing Bahrain to sell itself as a reformist this is really the trap that we had over the past 10 years and instead of really encouraging them to uh, uh, to continue the status quo we should really challenge them with how about conditions before we provide any other PR opportunity to them so it's extremely important to say let them seriously take serious measures without them don't don't engage with them thank you thank you very much um sayed for for being here and and for your intervention um i i can see that there's a question for brian but i'm not sure whether he's left a meeting i know he had to go at 5 p.m so i will perhaps le read the question um out loud and ask another panelist to to answer this question Um, we now know that prominent human rights defender Lujain Al-Hazloul was released from prison yesterday. Her release comes less than a week after the White House called on the Saudi Kingdom to release political prisoners, including women's rights activists. Do you think that the White House will apply the same pressure on the Bahraini government to release political prisoners and activists? What are the hopes for the Bahraini human rights defenders currently behind bars? I don't know if Ala would like to, to answer this. She mentioned Lujain in, in her intervention, or if not, then um, Devin or, or Jeet can perhaps um, say something about this. I mean, we have hopes that Anthony Blinken, he's, um, he's visited Bahrain and um, he has some ties maybe to some of the groups. I'm not, I'm not party to kind of the direct bilateral meetings people have had with, that when, with Blinken when he was serving under Obama. Um, But I mean, it just seems like there's an open channel there in which we can begin to engage. Um, if, if they are indeed willing, they've started with Saudi Arabia to move beyond that, beyond a couple of symbolic, don't forget, I mean, not all women rights activists have been released from Saudi Arabia. Lujain was just a sim uh, one and there was a, a second lady. So we have to wait to see whether they're going to push further or they just wanted the symbolic um, release of one um, to get that kind of, tick box exercise done without going further into kind of the structural reforms. Don't forget just the release of prisoners doesn't really ensure any further rights. It just means you've managed to successfully release one. Um, there are hundreds of others, but then also the, the conditions, you know, the, the judicial structures and everything beyond that, that le leads to their arrest in the first place. Um, the laws, the, the, um, the freedoms that exist is, is more profound. And in those, And th th that's where the hard part comes in, really, because this is a completely sovereign issue and they won't allow any of those kind of opening democratic spaces um, to open up. Now, I mean, just from the question on the on the foreign minister, I mean, for anyone who's been engaged with Bahrain over the last 10 years, we have the, you know, we, the, the state has been using liberal human rights discourse more than any other regime that I can think of in the region. It actually really likes to use human rights language. It, you know, it's, it's invested in consultants, lobby groups, everything to kind of counter the discourse. And it's a testament to how strong the human rights movement is in Bahrain, that the government is invested so much in, in having a facade of, of liberal um, human rights in some way. So, you know, Bas Sherif Basuni was one. Um, and so we have a, a really good You know, and they got a lot of credit for having this kind of independent investigation that documented very severe cases of torture and extrajudicial killing. And the same people that were documented in that report are still in prison nine years on. You know, like it's not to say that there's no value in documenting human rights abuses, even if the state kind of accepts that, the state has accepted that it's tortured its own citizens and it's killed its own people. Yet there was there was no reparations. There were no those, the same people are still in prison. Those sentences are still upheld. Like nothing fundamentally has changed. But you know they will get credit for being the first Arab country to to have held an independent human rights investigation. 
you know so there's the actual use that there's a limit to where human rights can reach politically and it's very comfortable and sitting it wants to be the head of the human rights council it wants to you set up inspectorates and everything that uh jude mentioned um because if they, you know it, it can counter you know meps who come to ask questions with those things doesn't mean anything's changed on the ground in fact we have more prisons that are being built more cameras that are being installed in the prisons to supposedly stop torture in prison cells, but the torture still continues. So it's it's the practices that are the more prob problematic. That they they know what to say. They, it's a it's a regime that speaks um, that you know that's that speaks the language. It knows the West wants to hear, um, and it's, inv it's it's invested in that. Uh, it's invested millions of that. I mean, that's the only point I sort of wanted to add on that. Thank you very much, Ala. We don't have much time left, uh, so maybe we'll take one more question. Um, this one is from Matthew Cross. Are there any areas that we can applaud um, in which Bahrain is making strides? What is the best advice to give to Canada and other invested states to achieve human rights objectives? Ala, I see you want to speak again. Sorry, I just wanted to say that I mentioned that they, they're building extra prisons and they've installed more um, they've installed more cameras and they've also probably hired more Western consultants like John Yates and others who, who you know, I mean, that, they think that's an investment, right? Like that's an investment in improving conditions. Um, uh, that, I mean, I can't, if anyone can, else can think of something. No, unfortunately, I have nothing positive to add to the developments in, in uh, human rights in the last year. At least, I mean, we've seen you know, just <laughs> death sentences being upheld at a record pace in the last year. So, I mean, it's not slowing down. Things don't seem to be getting better. One thing that's interesting I found, I mean, Nabil Rajab was released from prison uh, under community service. So some prisoners are being allowed out under community service, but they're being forced to sign statements that say, I will not criticize any state institution. Yeah. So it's like kind of, they will then come with, they will always have something to say that, you know, we've improved, look, we're, we're releasing people on community service, but every, even Nabil Rajab has signed a statement that says, I will not criticize state institutions. Um, so in that sense, he's, is he a free man, like these things, but again, that's going to be seen as, as a, a step forward, but I don't see that as a step forward, but I can't, you know, people have the right to engage and accept those, the, 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 those, those kind of conditions. Thank you, Ella. Um, yeah, thank you to all the panelists for answering our questions. Unfortunately, we don't have time to answer more of them. Um, but any, in any case, thank you. And thank you also to MEP Tarabella for your intervention and MEP Neumann for your questions. Um, and we would also, Sara and I would like to share our appreciation and gratitude towards MEP Urtasun for hosting this event with us and giving us a platform to commemorate this important date um, but before we go, I would just like to briefly summarize the main topics that we discussed today. So we focused on the shrinking democratic space in Bahrain, the role of women in civil society, the instrumentalization of the death penalty, um, and attempts of authoritarian regimes to silence freedom of speech. I, I really hope that today's discussion on the worrying outcomes of the Arab Spring in Bahrain 10 years later has helped to build awareness of the worsening human rights conditions on the ground and hope that this discussion can spark a debate around possible solutions and venues for action that the European Union might adopt to effectively address these dramatic intensifications of human rights abuses. Yeah, and, um, and to add on to what my, my colleague Ruth just said when she mentioned possible venues of action um, for the European Union, the, uh, the European Centre for Democracy and Human Rights would like to offer three possible recommendations of policies that we believe need to be formulated and, and implemented in this context. Firstly, we recommend replacing the quiet diplomacy approach that so far um, has been endorsed by the European Union. In Bahrain, at least, the European Union has mostly held closed door negotiations. However, given the gravity of the human rights situation um, on the ground, the European Union should be more vocal now than ever in publicly calling on the Bahraini government to, to implement change and to implement reform. 
Secondly, and, and in order to send that strong message that human rights violations can no longer be justified by the um, European institutions, an urgent resolution um, should be adopted by the European Parliament on these matters. The ECDHR, together with Reprieve, together with BIRD, um, have, uh, and, and in collaboration with the Office of MEP Tarabella, have prepared a, a motion for a resolution on the death penalty and the suppression of the political um, opposition in Bahrain. And we really hope that the MEPs will vote uh, to add this to the agenda for the next plenary session in March. Thirdly, and, uh, and finally, in December last year, through a uh, decision adopted by the Council of the European Union, the EU global human rights sanctions regime was, was officially established. In order to hold the perpetrators of human rights abuses accountable for, for their actions, we recommend that the European Union imposes targeted sanctions against such individuals. For months, the ECDHR has compiled evidence of Bahraini officials who have contributed to, to a pattern of human rights um, abuses in Bahrain and who ought to be held accountable for their actions. So we really hope that, that this new instrument will be explored by the European Union, by, by the Parliament, the Council, the External Action Service, as, um, as a possible venue of action to, to really address the, the rampant impunity enjoyed by, by officials of the Bahraini government to this day. Um, to conclude this, this event, I would like to, to thank all the panelists for their um, contributions to, to today's discussion. Thank you very much. Um, thank you also to, to the office of Emi Urtasun for co-hosting this conference with us. Um, thank you to, to Brian, to Emi um, Tarabella for, for their special interventions. And um, finally, a huge thank you to, to all of you who have joined us today to, to learn more about the human rights situation in Bahrain 10 years after the year. Uh, 2011 peaceful demonstrations. Thank you all very much, and I hope you have a lovely evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Take care. Keep in touch. Thanks. Bye. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you for all. Thank you, Diane, for your help. Thank you. Thank you for all indeed. It was a very great debate. Thank you very much. Thank you all for attending. Thank you so much. Have a lovely evening.